uh, just so um, people can have this as a briefing resource. Um, my name is James Parr. I'm the founder of uh, the Frontier Development Lab, and I wanted to um, thank you all for um, joining today. This is a very short briefing. Um, uh, as ever with FDL, there's always a vast amount of content, um, but we really wanted to give you all a quick overview of our plans for FDL Europe 2020. Um, we have also invited uh, some of the um, stakeholders who have helped us shape the challenges for 2020, um, so you can chat to them directly about the work. And really, that's the goal of today, is to um, give you a, um, a, a sort of overview of, of how FDL is going to work this year, but also um, the challenges that we're looking to take on. <clears throat> um, uh, so just as a um, sort of quick sense of uh, the flow of the next hour, I'm going to do a very quick introduction. Uh, and then we're going to uh, talk about the uh, the four challenges that are in play. Um, just as a heads up, I think it's probably likely we'll do three. Uh, we're just not sure which three. So we're going to talk about <laughs> the four of them today. Uh, and you never know, we may be able to figure out a way of doing four, but certainly we're probably on the glide path to doing three in Europe uh, this year. That doesn't mean that we won't get around to doing it. It's probably mean that um, just the way that we uh, look at our capacity that we actually have to just re-vector and put uh, one of the challenges for 2021 but certainly you know we'll get uh, if you are applying and your interest uh, is in one of these ones um, we won't forget about you we'll certainly um, make sure that you're um, part of our um, uh, our database and, and the, you know if it does end up being in 2021 then um, we're sorry that we can't do it this year but we'll figure out a way of doing it in the future um, so just as a yeah, just as a quick um, overview, we're going to look at uh, constellations, um, and this is uh, a challenge which is sponsored by our friends at ESA ESOC. Uh, then we're going to look at uh, swarms and uh, machine learning on board, uh, and this is sponsored by ESA Ezrin. Clouds and aerosols, uh, continuing the work from last year, and this is also um, supported by ESA Ezrin. And then lastly, Earth's digital twin. Um, which uh, is also uh, ESA Ezrin. So um, I'm hoping that some of our ESA colleagues are on the line as well today, so you can talk to them directly about the science and some of the goals and the reasons why ESA may be interested in solving these problems. And then for the last 20 minutes, at least, I hope we can have a Q&A and you can ask questions and we can uh, really dive into any of the um, issues you have, both in terms of the science goals, but also how FDL is going to work uh, this year. Um, so just, I promised a 10 minute sort of overview. Uh, this is uh, my bit, and then I'm going to hand it over to our colleagues who can talk about the challenges. Um, but really I wanted to bring FDL to life a bit for you, especially if you haven't been part of uh, the FDL journey up until now. And um, really the big idea, and it's not, particularly profound perhaps, but the big idea is that magic happens when you put uh, domain specialist scientists who really know the problem in a room with uh, machine learning specialists and then give them lots of resource. Um, and this is, um, you know, by, I guess, um, providing a lot of uh, um, framework and structure, it is possible to do science uh, sort of paper peer review paper quality work in a very short time period um, and we're extremely always extremely proud and amazed at what our researchers achieve um, I guess the other thing to say is that we um, aim to do work of, of, of importance to ESA um, and NASA in the United States uh, but also problems that matter so things that really uh, have broad um, impact on humanity and so um, FDL certainly has an AI for good mandate and all our work is um, uh, published for open source in the spirit of, of, um, of uh, sort of academic um, uh, aspiration, but also um, the work in the source code and all that sort of stuff we, we open source as well. Um, so we're in the, in the business of, of trying to help um, uh, organizations like UNICEF and uh, UNUSA, which is the UN's out of uh, out of space office, um, and um, you'll you know if you look at our our website, you'll see 
we've done a lot of work in disaster response and um, asteroids and uh, protecting the Earth from solar flares and, and those sorts of projects. Um, the bit of background to where it came from, um, I don't know if people are familiar with this uh, painting, but um, uh, if you've seen the movie Interstellar, you will have seen a computer generated version of this. But this was uh, conceived at NASA Ames um, in uh, 1977, and um, a, a guy called Gerard O'Neill um, did, did um, the summer study, um, and uh, this was the output of that summer study. And this is essentially kind of what we pitched um, five years ago: to say, listen, this was a really good idea. What happened to the su summer studies? Let's let's spin them up up again, but let's use machine learning as our sort of amplifier. So that's sort of you know what we're inviting you to join us to do is to think big and you know spend your summer doing some you know exemplary work um, uh, but it may be also useful to sort of know how we think about FDL in a sort of science and machine learning context um, you know we're really trying to show best practice in machine learning for science that means really you know starting to lead um, in explainability and reproducibility. Unfortunately, you know, we have a really fantastic um, community of machine learning specialists that um, are world class in, in these areas. Um, we're also sort of moving out of supervised, um, although we have done supervised machine learning in the past, but we're now really looking for projects that push the state of the art to um, unsupervised using sparse or unlabeled data. Um, as I mentioned, always really making sure that explainability is a core um, core of what we do, um, and data fusion. Um, you know, starting to starting to work with multiple data sets and learning how to pull insights out of multi-dimensional uh, data sets. Um, and um, so again, this is you know, if you're new to machine learning, that's okay. We'll support you with people who are uh, experts in machine learning pipelines. Uh, if you're a machine learning specialist, that's fantastic. Um, wanted you to know that we are looking at pushing state of the art and that hopefully the work that you'll be doing with us will be, um, you, know, you know, align well with the research that you're doing and also, um, you know, produce stuff which is, uh, you know, shareable at AAAI or NeurIPS or, or any of those other um, uh, conferences. Um, <clears throat> just again sort of how we think about um even though we do the work over the summer it's a year-long program we have been in the development phase for the last um uh few weeks problem definition this red little red uh, circle sort of shows where we are we're now in team alignment alignment which is why we're talking to you now um then we'll go into data prep and preparation and then the sprint actually happens over the summer um, and then we change gears to write papers and then um, that gets taken to NeurIPS. And then this year we're starting to think more about deployment, but perhaps we'll talk about that on another call. Um, and so this gives you a sense of the timing. Um, we're actually in the development phase right as we speak. Um, and then set up data prep, data ingestion, all that sort of stuff will start happening in May, June. And then the sprint happens, um, it kicks off on the 22nd of June and goes for eight weeks until mid-August. Uh, and then um, the results are bundled up and taken to um, the uh, AI conferences at the end of the year. Um, perhaps I'll jump over that. I think if you, if you look at our handbooks and other um, uh, um, so outputs, you can see, you know, this is what we've achieved over the last five years in both um, the US and Europe. Um, and um, uh, I think the, the message of this, um, although there's a lot of data to take in, the message is that we really want to try and make sure that there's work um, that comes out of this which is useful for you and aligns well with your research and your careers. Um, and really the big message is, yes, we're trying to do work which um, uh, gets to NeurIPS and other other um, conferences. If you're not familiar with NeurIPS, NeurIPS is really the premier um, ML conference, which is held usefully for us at the end of the year in December. And uh, last year we actually had 12 papers um, at uh, various workshops at uh, NeurIPS. And uh, you'll see here that actually the clouds 
um, team managed to get best paper at the uh, climate change uh, workshop, which we're very proud of. We also held one of the only four official NeurIPS uh, social events, and we did a space quiz there. And you'll see uh, one of our other teams as well um, uh, presented uh, at the, I think it was the disaster um, workshop. Um, and there's a photo of them at the bottom there. Um, so I also mentioned that it's, uh, I guess, this combination of putting together specialists and domains and, and, and machine learning specialists, but also we have a lot of support from uh, the private sector. Uh, so a lot of um, you'll be working sort of closely with uh, experts from from our partners in Europe. That's Google Cloud, Intel, IBM, NVIDIA, um, Element AI, uh, Space Applications, Catapult, U University of Oxford, um, which actually are our, are our hosts for um, FTL in Europe, and um, and uh, hopefully also Airbus will join this year. Um, so that's really the setup, and we can talk more about FDL at the end of this briefing, uh, but really perhaps it would be useful to change gears um, to talk about the science. Um, just to, again, a reminder of the dates. Um, the sprint is kicking off on the 22nd of June and lasts for eight weeks until Friday, 14th of August. But this year, because we're going virtual, we're actually going to do an on-ramp um, for the four weeks prior. So this is basically kicks off on the 25th of May, and goes through to the 19th of June. This is informal, but we'll be doing a lot of the work to build the, if you like, the personal relationships um, that are needed to actually do this work well. And so um, there'll be opportunities to get to know each other, um, uh, but also we'll be doing a, a virtual boot camp in the, in the week before FDL begins. Um, and again, this is a chance to really sort of get acclimated. So when you hit the ground running on the 22nd of June, everybody hopefully will know each other and know expectations. So um, sort of changing gear to talk about the work, um, uh, I'd like to talk about the constellations. I don't know if Francesca is, is on, do you know? Ah, there you are, yeah. yes, brilliant. Uh, Francesca, do you want to uh, give us five minutes about this uh, project and, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the mic. Yes, okay, thanks. So good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Francesca Letizia. I'm a space debris engineer at uh, ESA Space Debris Office in Germany. So what is space debris, first of all? So when we talk about space debris, we refer to the, all the artificial non-functional objects that are in orbit around the Earth. And currently, there are more than 900,000 objects that are larger than one centimeter. So they are big enough to destroy a satellite in case of collision. And out of these, uh, 23,000 objects are larger than 10 centimeter, and they, can, uh, they are regularly tracked by surveillance networks on ground. Now, at the European Space Agency, every day we receive more than 1,000 conjunctions notification for these uh, tracked objects for a fleet that our fleet is quite small, let's say we have only uh, 20 spacecraft. And the processing of this notification, which means deciding on which conjunction uh, will react and how, it's a really intensive task in terms of manpower and therefore also in terms of cost. And uh, you can see that on one end, uh, each maneuver results in an inter interruption of the satellite operation. So you really want to maneuver only when it's really needed. But on the other end, you want to be very confident that you're not going to lose your satellite because you didn't maneuver where you should have uh, done it. And as I said, so the current process uh, for this collision avoidance is uh, intensive. And we think that in its current shape, it will likely become unmanageable in the future. And this is because of the improvement in the number of objects that can be observed from ground, but also because of the so-called large constellations which we refer in the title of the activity. And this large constellation plan to launch a number of satellites that are that is larger or what has been launched so far in the whole history of space flight. So for this reason at ESA, uh, we are looking into development of automated collision avoidance systems um, to reduce the cost and also to address the need for uh, more effective decision making. So the idea is to move from a manual expert work uh, where you have multiple parameters that need to be processed and analyzed to uh, an automated system. Uh, they're able to uh, classify the conjunctions and identify which one really pose an actual risk to the, to the missions. 
And we think that a way to do so is uh, by applying machine learning using a training data, um, the database that we have built over these years, um, with, where we store all the, the geometry and the, the evolution over time of the ge geometry of the different conjunction events that have involved our, our spacecraft. And so we think that starting from this data is should be possible, or it could be possible to classify conjunctions and highlight which are the risky ones. And then besides the analysis of the data on the conjunctions, the idea is also to uh, test whether machine learning methods uh, can be used to predict the level of solar activity, uh, which in turn affect uh, the modeling on how the trajectory of a spacecraft will evolve, um, and especially the effect of the atmospheric drag. And this model, in turn, can be fed to the, the risk prediction method and hopefully improve our current process. So this is, in brief, the description of the challenge that we have in mind. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Francesca. Um, we probably have time for a question, if anybody wants to probe a little deeper into this one. This, this is Antonio, um, uh, I'm um, from Octo. Hi Francesca, uh, just a quick question. What data do you have to predict uh, the cycles of, uh, of the sun? I know that this is like 11 years, but how long in the past uh, you can go? Uh, since, uh, since when you have uh, data for this? Yeah, so for this, uh, we are looking at short-term prediction. So when we talk about the prediction for collision avoidance, um, we are more interested in the short-term prediction and uh, we have data, I think, from our own missions, um, to, sorry, no, for, uh, in our own database, we have data in the past, uh, I think, 10 years or something like that, but I know that there are databases where you can have longer time series. But I think the one that uh, we, we have currently, they cover this um, amount of period, more or less. Great stuff. Uh, Francesca. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm Rishabh, I'm from India. Uh, so one of the questions I had is uh, with the number of space uh, satellite constellations and the CubeSats which are being lost. Uh, so are they also considered under the space debris category uh, with the number increasing? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I'm not sure I get it. Yeah, sure. So uh, with the increase in the number of small satellites like Starlink and the satellite constellations mm -hmm. which you are saying, yeah. So, uh, are you also considering them uh, as a future potential for space debris? Yes. Yeah, so basically, we we do this kind of analysis. So, and this would be exactly one of the things that we want to look at this with with this challenge is to be to have our system to be more future proof for in case this constellation will all become operational, and then you have this very different number of objects, um, both operational and non-operational, in orbit. Thank you. Excellent, um, Chris. You, you uh, I think you had a, uh, you had a chance to support this. You said. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm happy to happy to help support this one. Uh, I've, my, I have uh, PhD students working in machine learning for orbit and trajectory analysis as well. Excellent. Thank you. All right, and thanks, Francesca. In the interest of time, I might um, jump on. And and since Chris, uh, uh, everyone's heard your voice, so I wonder if you if you want to jump in and take on this one. This is um, Swarms and Machine Learning on Board, and this is uh, supported by uh, the team at ESA Ezrin. Yeah. So hi everyone. My name's Chris Bridges, um, and I'm an academic at Surrey Space Centre. And most of my work that I've been doing for about the last ten years or so has been on implementing intelligence, um, and importantly, how we can get the uh, machine learning um, as well as AI type of techniques on board aerospace systems um, which is notoriously tough um, and to understand you know how and why you need to do that without compromising any science and actually doing something useful is is particularly uh, pertinent right now uh, and a key area of that is on constellations um, and the use of uh, super resolution which is really where you can take multiple images at a time do analysis on that um, and then to create then a, a, a larger resolution than is possible. So this is quite classic uh, image processing techniques, um, you know, that you would use for stacking. Um, 
But the main thing that we could do is we could look at actually other scenarios, um, such as whether or not you can then use multiple satellites to then take images of the same scene. Um, and because uh, the uh, optical uh, observer will be looking through the atmosphere at different locations, you'll actually be taking different parts of the spectra as well. Um, so you can actually use the atmosphere to sort of bend around really what is happening here. Um, and to actually start to then explore what we can do then if we take images of the same scene from multiple angles through different types of atmosphere to then create different types of data sets. So these may be multi-spectral images, uh, and they may even be 3D images. Um, and the interesting part on how we would use ML here is whether or not there are tools that we can use, whether it's autoencoders, whether it is new compression schemes, um, that can then replace that data bottleneck. So if we start creating new types of data that no one has seen before, what is the best way to then get that data to ground? And could we do something on the fly using machine learning that can then be used for uh, suitable data links, which is typically our bottleneck. So that challenge really is, is quite open to uh, quite a bit of interpretation there. So we have then different satellites that maybe you'd be able to take different images but what we would do on board sorts to be needs to be driven by what science we can do so if we can create then new virtual instruments um, the question then becomes is well how do we get this data down to ground um, which is one of our, our biggest problems are there any questions um just while people are thinking Chris, I think it's fair to say that that this has actually got some really interesting engineering problems as well. And mm. um, even though, <clears throat> as I said, we're normally sort of big R, little d uh, in terms of research and deployment, uh, you have to think about deployment with this challenge. Um, so I think certainly we're excited about you know looking at um, you know really understanding the sorts of processes that may be available for this. Uh, but also understanding um, how you may have to scale models to work in, in this scenario. Yeah, maybe uh, I could talk a bit on that as well. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, so most of my work is currently done at the moment with uh, SSTL, Airbus and ESA. Um, and that means really that I am at the coal face of implementing the real processes that then go on and, and fly. Um, and what's interesting with this one is that you, we're not going to have GPUs or cloud services to be able to do this. We need then very, very deep coupling between what the images are going to do and the pipeline by where the data goes. Um, so there's those immediate challenges there before we can even look about creating then different types of instruments that come out of this. So this is very different to perhaps some of the other ones where we can have throw data at it. But in this case, we might be looking at something that's definitely perhaps unsupervised that can then go, hey, we've got this new types of data coming together. As soon as we start stacking these things together, whether it be in spectral bands, whether it be in the same images for super resolution, what exactly do we need to do with that that can then take advantage of the redundancy in the data? So it's very much a data science thing that needs to happen, um, that needs to happen on the fly, and it needs to happen that is computationally efficient. Um, so this, this would suit a lot of people that are interested in um, uh, you know, the, the real computer science and data science and how you can then accelerate that and focus on throughput. Just to give you an idea of the sort of images that I'm, I'm used to working with, um, I might have 10 or 12 Sir Dares lanes all running at eight giga samples per second. We're generating more data than we can cope with. Um, the problem is, is then how do you get that down to the ground and how do you use it to create different and new data products? So, Chris, this is Alison from NVIDIA. Uh, there is another option, and that's the ISS laboratory um, are already working on the fact that HPE, who's also a partner for FDL, will have um, Spaceborne 2 um, on board the ISS by the end of 2020. There may obviously be some delays because of um, COVID. However, the, um, it, it shouldn't be too radically changed and pushed back. Now, the Spaceborne is actually going to have our T4 GPUs on there, which are specifically for low power um, inference. And so that's a resource that you could potentially use. And, and folks that are known to FDL were thinking about doing this a year and a half ago, actually. But it's a resource that you could use as like a base station for, you know, say a CubeSat constellation. 
um, there's already been uh, an, an external partner of ours using GPUs, using the, the Jetson GPUs in the you know, rather safer environment of the ISS for hyperspectral imaging for over a year. And they can, you know, they'll be quite happy to, to give you feedback on that. But having that resource on the ISS, we could potentially look to using, and the ISS laboratory are already, you know, talking about this as like a base station with, with large compute that could act um, as, um, you know, a, a site prior to downlink to do some of that, in, you know, onboard intelligence. Thanks, Alison. Um, has anyone got any other thoughts or questions? I've got one. Hi, uh, Freddie here from, um, I was a mentor at the previous FTL, uh, working on the super resolution project for uh, magnetographs. Uh, so one thought I have is, uh, well, one question and one thought. Uh, question is, what, uh, can you mention a few applications uh, where this will be used? Like what kind of, what kind of objects are you interested um, super resolve? Um, yeah, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, so um, from what I know from my industry partners, and I've heard this from a few more now, super resolution isn't necessarily the interesting part for that they are looking at. But looking at different scenes with different insights is. Um, so unfortunately, there's a bit of a, a science purist question there. Um, because Airbus and SSTO, I can tell you, I'm, I'm not so interested in super resolution. But they are interested in any in virtualized instruments. What what is a virtualized instrument? I'm sorry. So where uh, if if you think you could take some biostatic radar system where you've essentially got two points and you're you're doing something. Um, you know, using perhaps separate entities or separate components that come together to form one instrument. Oh. Okay. Uh, so, can you like can you mention one concrete example that would be like useful for for ESA to like what kind of data would they be keen to fuse to to get more detail out of? That that's what I'm trying to get at. Oh well, you, I mean it's number of nodes becomes how big an aperture that you can have then it becomes the question of how how you can control things in orbit so really that's the the biggest limitation really is how much you can control and manage your baseline and what actually is your truth for a given aperture i mean you're telling me that's, not, the necessarily how. The, that's what, what, not that's not necessarily the focus of this challenge though what is the focus of a challenge so the focus of the challenge will be then if we can then be able to virtualize an instrument using uh, you know, just a, a reference, um, what could we actually do with this if we actually now start to get different spectral data coming in, uh, high re uh, higher resolution ones? Um, and with that actual then cube of information that we get, how then do we then actually compress it? And what insights okay. can machine learning give from us that we can do at runtime on the fly? I mean, I, I get the, the your description is like pretty ubiquitous. You make it sound okay. I mean, I completely agree. This is in principle how it works. Um, my question is more on the like, for example, let's say for this particular uh, FDL challenge, what types of data would be would we be looking at? Because that will also inform types of super resolution algorithms we we'll be looking at. And you know, for the further on, like the way we're gonna optimize them, uh, you know, like compress them and so on. So the scenes that we're looking at at the moment um, certainly are from all the typical routes that you'd see from Copernicus and things, but we're talking with lots of the partners at the moment. And one of them would be Planet Labs as well. Um, and then there's Surrey and Airbus as well. So there's, there's different routes we need to explore there to find out whether or not we can get the scenes and the data we want. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Go ahead, Yaron. So I, I just joined, I joined late, so I, I didn't catch the beginning. So I might have some gaps in, the, in what you want to do. But from what I gather from just the discussion just now, you want to, from the sensory information that you have on board, you want to do super resolution 
and virtualize other instruments in order for you to make a decision, make, for example, a different observation, and then using that decision on your observation to send that back down instead of having to do back and forth with the gun station? Yeah, well, that's one of the things you could do. Um, so, like, concretely, I would ask, why do we need, like, why do we need to do super resolution at all, given that super resolution is not introducing any new information? That's not my focus. My focus is, for me, the spectral insights and the passive 3D. So maybe the, maybe just the, maybe just the, the, the technical comments in the description over here are a bit confusing because the, I think like a way of maybe, maybe that's why the stuff of 3D was confused about as well. Maybe a different way of explaining what you want to do is given the sensor information that you have now, what machine learning tools can be used to decide like to make a to make a decision? So I'd uh, I'd actually ask for a comment from our ETA colleagues if there's any there that are, are working on this one. Um, actually, I think uh, James, we'll have to probably, in the interest of time, move on and maybe come back to Q and A at the end of the session, uh, so that we can move on to the other topics. We're going to have a Q and A uh, for about ten minutes at the end as well, so we can circle back. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, I think it's really clear that, um, that for a virtual FTL, we'll really get to a good use case. Um, so apologies, Chris, um, you having to sort of defend um, a slightly foggy um, problem definition. In other years, we actually have allowed the teams to sort of find the use case. And so um, that's, uh, you know, sometimes that's actually part of, of um, or a deliberate, if you like, strategy. I think this year we certainly will have um, a much more defined use cases for everybody. And so I just wanted to say rest assured that these things will get resolved and we'll, we'll work um, to find, make sure that data and those use cases are, um, are sort of properly set up before we kick off. Um, so um, perhaps uh, changing gears, um, Duncan, are you are you uh, able to talk about uh, clouds and aerosols? Yes, absolutely. Hi everyone. So my name is Duncan Watson Paris. So I'm a postdoc at the University of Oxford, um, and my focus is is very much on on clouds and aerosols and their interactions. Um, this this challenge is is also slightly foggy at the moment. We uh, we had a great brainstorming session in Oxford. Uh, I guess a month ago now, and we're still we're still feeling that out and and turning that into a a quest, which would be more well defined for um, for the challenge. But I'll I'll briefly kind of describe the the problem space. So um, clouds are, are a critical component of of the atmospheric system and and indeed the Earth system. They reflect a third of the incoming sunlight back to space and provide all of the precipitation and um, in the earth, uh, vital obviously for crops and, and, and drinking water. Um, now, uh, climate change will, will affect the, the clouds and the precipitation. And one aspect of that change are the effect of aerosols, so anthropogenic aerosols. Um, and that, that change happens through um, actually how the droplets of the cloud form. So um, the cloud droplets require aerosol to form on, so the, the water vapor in the air condenses onto these, um, these nuclei, these aerosols, um, and, and form droplets. And if we, uh, as, um, as a species, emit more of these aerosols through emissions of sulfate and soot, etc., then we would provide more nuclei for these cloud droplets to form on. Um, and when you have more of these nuclei, more droplets, sorry, the cloud actually uh, is brighter. You have an increased surface area, essentially in more, more water to reflect sunlight back to space. And that it has, a, has a very small effect um, instantaneously on the cloud, um, but that small effect adds up and um, can ultimately have a large effect on the climate. So it can cool the planet, um, and affect the amount of precipitation and um, the locations of precipitation. And what we're primarily interested in is understanding this, uh, understanding and detecting and, and teasing apart the, the interaction between these aerosols which are emitted, how they affect the clouds, and then also how those clouds then affect the aerosol because the, um, the rain that, that forms, forms in the clouds also affects the aerosol. So you have this kind of feedback 
system. Um, and, and much of the problem, particularly um, with focus to here in remote sensing, is in detecting these very small changes um, in noisy systems um, with imperfect observations. And so that's really the crux of the problem. And we have a couple of um, ideas of how to make the most of um, the project which we successfully um, ran last year, which uh, involved unsupervised classification of cloud types because we we expect that these aerosol effects will behave differently for different types of clouds um, so we created this this cumulo data set which was received very well and we look forward to kind of building on that and, and digging into these mechanisms and these causal relationships in in more detail this year so i'll happily take any any questions on that thanks duncan I'm assuming the silence is people like <laughs> formulating the perfect, perfect question. I find um, Zoom is not very, uh, very good for generating questions. People seem to be. Well, that's the thing. So when you, you see there's 94 people, you think, oh, golly, am I going to sound like an idiot? Um, please, uh, I think somebody had a thought. Or, or... Hello? Yeah, hey. Oh, hey, uh, uh, Yin, Yin Kai here. Um, so, um, biological organisms play a role in the nucleation of clouds and so i'm wondering is that something where that will be tackling at all in um not directly uh they they as you as you say these these um biological volatile compounds certainly do play a role and they're one of the the kind of uncertain factors um so the the satellites the, the remote sensing instruments that we're using uh generally not able to determine the the type of aerosol very accurately um so that's a whole whole different issue that we probably won't be tackling but so we will use proxies for the amount of aerosol which the satellites can retrieve um typically a kind of optical um estimate of the amount of aerosol in in the atmosphere oh, oh so when you said uh, optical like what, what exactly is the data that we're re receiving Primarily, we rely on aerosol optical depth. So this is just the, the integrated extinction of the aerosol um, through the atmospheric column. Um, so with a good, good estimate of the surface brightness, we can um, determine how much of the incoming solar radiation is being scattered um, by aerosol in the atmosphere. If you assume, if there's no cloud in the way, then the only thing that's, that's scattering these, these particles that are kind of of order 100 nanometers or so is, is generally aerosol and so you can you can estimate how much aerosol is in the column and then if you make an estimate of the size then you can get some information about the number of aerosol um, but that's actually as i say another another difficulty in this is that we don't really have good observations from space of the number we have a good idea of the amount but the, the kind of mass but not the, not the number um, so looking for proxies of that and looking to improve those uh, relationships is, is another aspect to this. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. No worries. Hi, it's Alison. Um, Duncan, are we um, incorporating any of Christian's work into this or leaving it for uh, less controversial times? Uh, I'll um, pass to James for that. I actually don't know. Um, <clears throat> so, for everybody else on the call, this is the idea that. Um, uh, this, this, some of the thoughts or some of the work here could be used for geoengineering. Um, hence, uh, targeted, Alison, very yeah. targeted geoengineering, not yeah. you know. Yeah, um, machine and I, yeah, I think, I think we'll, let's leave it to the teams. I think the, okay. um, um, I mean, my my sense is that um, that we're uh, we're not there yet, um, but. Um, but you know, this is the sort of stuff that FDL likes to think about over a drink. Yeah. Um, okay. and, uh, but yeah, um, but certainly not explicitly. Um, Duncan, I think you're up on, uh, on the last one and then we'll perhaps, um, uh, change gears and, and, uh, open up for Q and A. So do you want to take us through the digital twin for earth? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is, this is an interesting one that was, um, came up quite recently actually so this is also still in development although actually i have slightly more concrete ideas about what this might look like um so this is this is the idea of of creating a um a hybrid 
physical uh, data-driven model to improve um, forecasting and to allow um, rapid tasking of observations where they're needed uh, most um, for for the detection of, of extreme events, so extreme weather events. Um, so just again broadly this this kind of space is um, dominated by the large weather forecasting centers so the ECMWF the European Center for Mid-Range Weather Forecasting and the Met Office uh, two, two examples who um, use these large numerical weather prediction models which take many hours to run and create these large ensembles that they use to, to run a projection um, and at the other end of that, you have um, efforts at Google and DeepMind to um, run completely data-driven models, forward um, projecting uh, weather systems from satellite imagery. So just taking, um, you see a system in, in a satellite imagery um, and you, you forward project it using optical flow or some other technique. Um, and what we're looking to do here is to really um, make a make a step forward and make a real, real kind of step change here, where we we use the the physical understanding, we leverage the physical understanding of the atmosphere which we have, to um, to provide these near term forecasts of extreme events um, that can run quickly um cheaply and potentially even um on on board so that other um other observations can be tasked and um and sent where they're most needed um that's the idea we have we have um some ideas of how that might happen and some of the the challenges that that will entail um but i think working with um, ecmwf and esa on this um we could we could make some really exciting um steps forward this, this summer on this Great stuff. And Guy, I don't know if you have any, if you were on and if you wanted to enrich Duncan's description at all. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you can see me. Uh, I just switched on my camera. I don't know if it's coming on. Um, anyway, this is Guy. Yeah, thanks, James. And, and Duncan, I think Duncan, I couldn't have said it better, certainly not. And, and he summarized it quite well. I think this is, I feel this is probably a bit more focused use case than I've seen in previous years. So I'm very happy nonetheless, very, very challenging. And I probably can uh, add something to the data. It's probably also a question to Duncan more directly in terms of the data, since that question has come up now a number of times from other people. Mm -hmm. uh, could, could there be uh, data also used from the Copernicus ECMWF climate data store, uh, ERA 5 and, and yeah. these? So is are the data going to be available also from the Met Office, for instance, you just mentioned? Probably not the Met Office. I think um, they, they hold on to those a bit more tightly. And yeah. um, given given the partners in here, I mean, the Era 5 data is is kind of leading. Um, yeah. It, it, you know, it's open and extremely good. So we should yeah. be crazy. So, so candidates here, I assume, will be looking more at like modeled reanalysis data. To yeah, analyze, it, essentially. Yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah so using um using the reanalysis data so this this is kind of so for those of you who don't know reanalysis data is um is kind of a rerunning the forecast once we know what's happened so we create this kind of best um best state of best estimate of the state of the atmosphere yeah. throughout the last 30 years um including all the observations we have and so we can use that to to learn the um the large scale atmospheric dynamics essentially and improve our models of yeah. what the uh, what these large systems and extreme events are going to do. Great. I probably forgot to say I'm I'm a floods person, so for everybody on the call that's wondering. So I'm dealing with floods and flood hydrology in general. I'm very glad to join Duncan in this challenge as a mentor. So really happy. Thanks. Fantastic. Um, any other reflections or questions on this one? All right. Um, I think we're we're tracking to our schedule. Um, so well done. Thanks so much for all our faculty leads on on taking us through um, the challenges and. And I uh, hope for everybody in the call that at least gave you a taste of the questions we're looking at. 
Um, and you'll see that um, you know some of them uh, actually do require some fundamental thinking, uh, which will hopefully lead to publishable outcomes. Um, and um, uh, of course, we're we're very keen on finding those um, those opportunities. So for the next, um, I guess for the rest of the call, um, uh, there's really a chance for Q and A. Um, again, we can make this about FVL itself or um, uh, uh, the the work. Um, I also wanted to encourage you um, if you haven't applied yet, um, there's still uh, one week to go. And please, um, uh, having listened to these challenges, if there's people in your network who are working on these things and you think would be um, good contributors, or you think that this would be uh, a good amplifier for their own research, uh, please do encourage them. Um, uh, uh, send them to uh, fdleurope.org. Um, this is the application page. It's very uh, straightforward. Um, but also to give you a sense of our thinking on uh, COVID-19, I think it's pretty clear that uh, we're not going to be traveling over the summer. Uh, even if life is getting back to normal. Um, and so we're going to be doing uh, FDL virtually, uh, certainly in, in Europe and um, most certainly in the US, although we haven't uh, had the final decision on that from NASA. Um, just to give you a sense of what that means, um, you will have heard um, about us using this word, this nomenclature of foggy versus more scoped challenges, we call them quests. And as I mentioned at the end of the discussion on the uh, ML on board, um, we won't be doing uh, as open-ended questions as we have in previous FDL. So we believe that for a virtual FDL, we need to have tighter challenge definition and we'll have all of the data and all the use cases pre-ingested pre pre and, uh, and ready for you to go. So there will be more work at the front end to get these challenges in shape. Um, so certainly there will be a use case for the machine learning on board challenge. We'll, we'll make sure, make sure of that. Um, also, and you can see here, I'm just reading on these, these lists at the bottom of the screen here. Um, so provision of more explicitly defined progress waypoints, so as well as deeper or um, more specific challenge definition, we'll be having clearer waypoints throughout the eight weeks. And so you'll also essentially have two week sprints to work towards. Um, and so it'll be more, if you like, modular in terms of the uh, workflow development. Um, we'll also be asking everybody to work uh, in a sort of coherent day, if like. We're going to uh, choose a time zone and then everybody will sort of work more or less on that time zone. Uh, and we'll be develop, uh, designing the team so they can work and have like a unified day. So what we don't want is for um, you know, individuals being um, eight hours out of sync, uh, we want teams to be able to work together, and so essentially it's a, it's a working day. Uh, we do provide you with a stipend. You get a salary. This is a job, uh, and so we'll be, you know, we're expecting you to do a full full days of day of work uh, in parallel with your team members, even though it will be virtually. Um, we'll be investing a lot in trust and cohesion, making sure that uh, you get to know your team members, and so uh, there's good good. Um, good capacity to work through hard problems which most certainly will come together we'll also be inviting you to do pair coding and work uh, in ways which uh, you know really facilitate um, uh, good cross-pollination uh, even though that you'll be uh, separated um, and then um, uh, collaboration tools so we're still working out the best suite but we'll be asking all the teams to use the same suite of tools uh, and um, there will be a sort of combination of Zoom and Slack and other things that we're experimenting with. Uh, and so hopefully we can get uh, you know, a very good uh, analogue to uh, being in, in a room together. So that's um, really everything from us, and I wanted to open up the floor for questions and see what uh, people, people are thinking. Uh, James, it's a bad. There was a question that came in uh, over the weekend. Yep. And that one is the application appears to be the same for both FDL Europe and NASA FDL. Can applicants be considered for both programs and how do we specify our preference? Yeah, so uh, essentially the, if you like, the funnels for both FDLs go into the same pot. Um, and, but during the application process, certainly if you're coming through the FDL Europe 
you'll see there's a chance to say, listen, this is the challenge I'm most interested in. And so essentially that means that we can, if you like, start to filter you down to the challenge which is most appropriate for your research. Um, generally, we'll be looking at things like, you know, fit in terms of your prior work uh, uh, to actually tackle the, um, the challenge at hand, but also some other factors to um, uh, uh, technical capacity, uh, the balance of the team, um, the location where you're going to be um, for the duration. Um, and uh, it may be that we will, we'll, we'll, I'll say this, we'll certainly try and make sure that you uh, have your first preference. Absolutely. And normally it does work that way, but it may be that uh, when we get to the final um, overview of the challenges on both sides, both uh, NASA FDL and ESA FDL, we say, well, actually, these this team member could work really well on this project, and we may invite you to to, to swap. Uh, this only happens in a handful of cases. Generally, we we make we make sure that uh, people get their first choice, um, but that's essentially how it works. And the other thing I'll add is that essentially our our faculty, the folks that you heard on the call today, they are ultimately it's their, they're they're in charge of of forming the team, so we follow their guidance on on what would make the, the best combination. Are there any more questions? There are a few in the chat. Just replied to Yen Kai. Um, this is really the, the, the pivotal point of, of FBL is this cross collaboration. So don't worry about um, potentially not having you know ex expertise because there'll be somebody else working alongside you who does that cross collaboration is exactly what FBL is about. And we're even, you know, as James said, putting in an additional few weeks for folks to really get to know each other because everything's remote this year. You're not literally sat next to them. Um, in terms of more detail on the challenges, um, it's actually quite a lot of work to turn these projects into if you like, from sort of quite broad definitions to um, we call them quests, these you know defined waypoints and the data identified. Um, and so probably they won't be completed by your application date. However, of course, by the time that we get going um, in May, sorry, in June, um, there'll be a far greater problem definition. But um, I think uh, for now, for the next week, this the, unfortunately this is the the most uh, information we can give you. Um, uh, but uh, but certainly by the time we start, there'll be, as I said, um, far more focus. All right, we still have five minutes. Um, Someone did ask when the application results will be released. So the um, we'd like to get you um, a letter of acceptance in early May. That's normally the time timeline we work to, and of of course we're conscious that there are other opportunities, and uh, we want to give you um, a sense of of uh, the commitment as soon as we can. It does take us a while to um, do the job of getting all the teams sorted out, um, and so that probably applications will close next week. It's probably going to take two or three weeks. And so I'd say that the earliest would get letters to you would be the end of the first week of May. And we had a question of how many people will be on each team? So the teams are, are four researchers, um, two ostensibly two machine learning and two domain specialists. Um, so, for example, for the digital twin for Earth, uh, there may be somebody who's a card carrying um, climate modeler. There may be somebody who's a uh, specialist in um, Earth observation, Earth systems. Uh, then there may be somebody who's a specialist in high performance computing and the interaction between HPC and uh, neural nets. Uh, and often we, we like hybrids too. I mean, 
with a problem like that, um, it's actually really useful to have people who can speak both languages, both um, earth science, but also high performance computing and neural nets. Um, but the idea essentially is we create a split. So there's a sort of um, part of the team that can talk the earth science and part of the team that can talk uh, machine learning. Um, and then you're supported by a mentor, a machine learning specialist, um, and then a domain specialist. And then there's a super mentor. In this case, it's going to be Duncan. And uh, Duncan's going to be supporting on both the aerosols and the digital twin earth um, project. Uh, so essentially, you'll have a sort of, if you like, a group of seven people you're working with closely. And then we have our... Um, uh, machine learning faculty, so individuals like Yaron, who you heard talk um, during the call, uh, and experts who we sort of bring in who will be working with you as well. Um, and then every week we do uh, reviews and check-ins, and there's a chance for um, everybody to help move move the needle a little bit. There was a question for Chris from Prabhu. Uh, are there more details available for your projects? Can they find them? Uh, so for this particular one that we've got going at the moment on the machine learning on board, um, as you can see from the discussion, is that we need to figure out a bit more exactly what the use case uh, is going to be. And in particular, what is the actual machine learning that we need to use? Um, and then there's a separate question on the, on the data sets. So between um, you know, myself, James, you know, Yaren and Freddie, we're, we'll, all, we'll all be talking and figuring that out uh, you know, very, very soon. Um, because I, I'm more of a domain specialist for the space side, uh, whereas I would look to Yaron and Freddie for more of the ML types of activities. So we just need to come together, but uh, the current situation has put some spanners in the works um, for everyone at the moment. So I'm, we're just a little behind on that, but they will be defined very soon. Thank you. <coughs> And then how important is publishing for the application if we can demonstrate alternative experience? I mean, I think we, we consider everybody, um, I think the, we've had examples of people who left academia and went into industry and have actually got deep experience through industry. And so they actually haven't got necessarily a good publishing um, track record. I mean, generally we're looking for people who are um, PhD, or postdoc, that's sort of where our sweet spot is. Um, but if you have, um, if you've got really deep um, uh, uh, programming um, experience, Python in particular, um, uh, but also full stack, uh, and uh, and it also and actually you have shown or proven that you've done machine learning uh, in industry, then of course you're considered uh, equally to the folks that are still in academia. All right, so how are we doing for time? I think uh, we've got two more minutes. I want to I want to use this last two more minutes. Is there uh, any other questions about how we're going to do it virtually? There must be some. Yeah, uh, I mean the first thing that I'm really wondering, I'm curious to see how it pans out, is uh, like how do you how do you create a glue in a team virtually? You know, this is the quintessential. Element. Yeah, yeah. So this is really this is the hardest question, and and thanks, Freddie, for bringing it up. Like FDL is difficult. We are doing research, <clears throat> um, and and obviously this requires sort of the strong interpersonal connections that um, allow teams to really to really um, you know to really work, and and so we'll be investing a lot of time in that, and. Um, so really that's the week, sorry, the four weeks I mentioned before the sprint, we'll be doing a lot of work sort of to help you get to know each other, to get to know your team really well, to build those interpersonal relationships. Um, and that's going to be from, uh, you know, simple stuff like, you know, getting to each, know each other through doing quizzes and games to actually uh, doing sort of, um, I guess, uh, uh, sort of i guess I, i'm going to call it fun it is like um meeting um isa uh specialists doing one-on-ones um virtual cafes those sorts of things but we we're going to take this really seriously there's going to be a lot of um uh, emphasis on building those interpersonal connections because actually you can't do 
exemplary work if you don't have them. And so be prepared for, for those sorts of, uh, of things to be happening. So James, this is key. Just maybe one quick thing that goes with that. I think it's going to be that plus one challenge for everybody, right? How will you do this virtually? But as a personal experience last year, if you remember, I, I couldn't join physically because of stupid me. So I, I did join the teams virtually. It's actually, I think what was required from my side a lot more was being very disciplined. So when I was on the call to make sure that uh, I was very well prepared and, you know, the, the one thing that's always uh, kind of very challenging is also the connection, the, the, the virtual connection, you know, and <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's possible, but it's a very good question and it will be a challenge, I think, but that's, it's good because everybody has to go through these challenges right now, right? The virtual meetings and everything. So yeah. I think it'd be a good experience. It was for me definitely last year. We also, um, during our boot camps, we also do a lot of work on, you know, what it takes to go through, you know, the chasm or the trough or whatever the analogy is that is always a part of doing something new. And the message is that new is always hard. It always, you cannot get away from this. Um, and so this is why the behaviors you have um, as a team member are extremely critical. You need to, you basically need to have good, um, collaboration hygiene, shall we say. Um, and so we'll spend a lot of time on that. And we actually have a specialist um, called Belina and she's amazing at this and she's um, going to be supporting all the teams and she'll be making sure that uh, everybody is sort of, um, you know, humming and uh, all those sorts of things are being spotted early and figured out. So, so yeah, um, we're completely aware that um, this is um, extenuating circumstances. <coughs> <clears throat> that we do be doing our best to make sure that um, everything works and that we can replicate uh, a real world experience as close as we can. Um, all right. I think that's our top of the hour. I think I wanted to thank you all for joining just a reminder. Um, please do apply. Um, and, um, and again, if you're sort of thinking um, of a friend or anybody who, you know, uh, who would be um, able to support on any of these challenges, um, specialist in edge, um, specialist in high performance computing and the interface of neural nets, specialists in um, aerosols or uh, climate change, and then people who've been thinking meaningfully about you know, complex systems and curvilinear error volumes and um, all the things which come with managing constellations. There's some really interesting and difficult problems and we are still looking for people who are interested in solving them. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all our partners, of course, ESA um, and University of Oxford. Thanks for joining. And then, uh, of course, Google Cloud, Intel, um, NVIDIA, IBM, KX, Element AI, Airbus, and the Satellite Applications Catapult. Um, that's it from us. Thanks for joining and uh, look forward to uh, working with you all in the summer. Take care. Thanks everyone. everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thanks, James. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye.